Well, uh, good evening, everybody. And uh, firstly, uh, I too want to offer my uh, sincere thanks to all of you for coming, but also to the uh, Frank Jackson Foundation for sponsoring me as the first Professor of Environment. And uh, as Richard said, only, I think, second or perhaps third new chair in 400 years. So I am extremely grateful. And I, I do very much hope that Gresham's engagement with uh, this new, I would say, cross-disciplinary realm, the intersection of science, social science, economics, politics and the arts, and perhaps even dark arts, will, will prove a rewarding one. Um, I am a scientist, as Richard said, an environmental scientist, focusing... Uh, for most of my working life on human influence on the water environment and I, and I have a passion for attempting to uh, to manage this it's one of life's uh, one of our life critical resources and it needs managing better uh, again as Richard said I've had a, a, a lengthy academic career mostly uh, or most recently at Oxford uh, running alongside my own environmental consultancy in which uh, I've dealt with a range of environmental challenges such as things like mining, housing development, industrial contamination, drinking water, degradation, and so on, in various parts of the world. Um, and we'll see some of those reflected in, in the material I talk about. Uh, again, uh, my current job at the Knowledge Transfer Network is focused on the development of environmental technologies. It's about innovation, innovative ways of managing humanity's needs, not just for water, but for energy, food, resources, and so on. And I do have that keen interest in innovation, uh, which, again, I shall touch on in, in later talks. Uh, just as a, uh, an interest in uh, innovation and the, and the practical application of science um, underpins most of my work, just as, a, as, a, as an aside, I, uh, people seem to find this interesting, but I do run a service for the police, uh, tracing the movement of dead bodies floating through river systems, uh, usually, usually murder victims, actually, as they, as they float along, and I will elaborate on that in a later talk. Uh, my husband told me to say that a TV series is yet to come, but uh, I dare say that will require a more attractive and agile female lead. He didn't say that, by the way. Um, so, my forthcoming Gresham lectures are going to reflect on the challenges of applying environmental science, specifically water science, to the solution of real-world problems and um, to promote sustainable practice. I, uh, if we move on... Um, the talks will tease out some of the themes around innovation, specifically open innovation and partnership, drawing on my own research and consultancy experience. Applied science, innovation and partnership are all contested terms, and for those of you who have specific and detailed interest in one or other of these areas, I hope my analysis won't be too superficial. But over the course of this year and the next two, I will be looking specifically at the linkages brokered by the nature of the communications that occur between people working in different arenas and from different perspectives. The science community, the politicians, industry, education, the voluntary sector, community groups, government agencies, professional bodies, and so on. Um, in fact, I will be allowing some of them, some of the representatives of the, these people, to share their views with you through recordings, and we will do some of that today. I'll be picking up on whether technology, genetics, biochemistry, physics, social media, the cloud, and so on, whether those provide new opportunities for creating sustainable solutions to environmental problems, or whether they raise more challenges than they solve. Uh, whether they are, for example, beneficial in assisting innovation, desperately needed actually in many areas, as we shall see later, or whether they're merely what I would call an illusion of agency. Uh, I should say that perhaps in no other realm of Gresham College's interest would it be necessary to say that the lectures won't be relaying apocalyptic catalogues of catastrophe, hazard, environmental or moral and conflict, but offering some thoughts on frameworks for considering environmental challenges and perhaps the basis for optimism. In my view, we are an innovative 
and resourceful species. However, um, firstly, I'd like to take you uh, on a little diversion into the realms of wickedness. For those of you who are like me, are, are Gilbert and Sullivan aficionados, uh, and uh, I'll pause there because I'm not going to sing, and I don't expect anybody else to either. Um, the Wicked World it, it was a blank verse play by W.S. Gilbert. It opened at the Haymarket Theatre in 1873, at the beginning of one of the most famous collaborations or partnerships in history. And it was an allegory about conflict, resolution, uh, reconciliation, moral hazard, and the compensation that mortals are given for all the troubles that they must endure on earth. Conflict, reconciliation, moral hazard, and reward. Please do remember those. Alongside other environmental resonances, the plot shares some similarities with Shakespeare's Midsummer Night's Dream, where human and mythical beings, uh, people with very different ambitions, collide. And it also engages with the consequences that ensue when an all-female world is disrupted by men, something which I'm guessing about half of us in the audience might regard with some wry amusement. Um, a female world was laughable in Victorian times and still is now too. Women are amongst those most seriously compromised by environmentally driven uh, inequalities. The wicked world provoked a lot of dissent at the time and in fact Gilbert sued the Pall Mall Gazette which had called the play indecent because of a reference to mortal love, whatever that might be. Uh, he lost the case on indecency incidentally. The play was ruled to be indecent. I'm sure it wouldn't be by today's standard. Now, over the course of my lectures this year, I want to explore a little more about wicked worlds, wickedness, or specifically the concept of wicked problems, and how wicked environmental problems are conceptualised and addressed by these different stakeholder groups, businesses, education, uh, voluntary agencies, and so on. But I'm going to start with a story. About... Fifteen years ago, a colleague and I took a group of UK undergraduates on a field trip to Uganda. The field trip also involved our participation in a development aid partnership with a teacher education college in a remote district in the east of the country. It was actually about here somewhere, right in the middle of uh, nowhere, actually. Um, we were working with the National Teachers College Calero at their request to bring and install their first computers and to train their staff and students in their use. The computers were recycled from some of the high-tech businesses in Cheltenham and uh, my students undertook a course in IT training and they worked together to raise the money to take the machines and the know-how out to Africa. This was, I think, a, a worthy objective which proved very successful and it instigated a 10-year mutually beneficial partnership and friendships, in fact, between the groups. Two or three undergraduates, in fact, even went to Uganda afterwards to start businesses uh, or development aid projects. Now, whilst in Kaliro, I undertook a small piece of research uh, with students from both institutions looking at water use and water quality around Ugandan villages. Now, Uganda is a very, very poor country. It has a low human development index of 0.456, in 2012, that's probably not very meaningful, but basically it lies 161st out of 187 countries, uh, a rank which, despite its newly discovered oil resources, it shares with Haiti. And some other statistics, courtesy of UNICEF, are shown on the slide here, and it is a very sobering picture. Now, there is no shortage of rainfall in Uganda, but there were, and there are, enormous water-related health problems. The women and the children in rural areas, there's a what, seat at the front here as well. There's the seat, seat here and a couple more over there. The women and children in rural areas collect water from wells or boreholes and the poorer ones from puddles or swamps. And they carry it home in 25 litre plastic jerry cans. In the past, these containers would have been more picturesque, but less effective. Here you can see some of the, the, uh, the sources that they use. Uh, here we go. Now, 
Most of them have, uh, most of these people ha uh, had and have limited money for fuel to boil the water. And for some people, especially children, the pathogens in the water produce chronic illnesses that kill them. The pattern of water use was the subject of earlier and seminal, I beg your pardon, earlier and seminal research by Gilbert White and his colleagues in 1972. And by the time we went to Uganda some years later, little had changed for the better despite the efforts of a large number of aid agencies, scores of water policies, stakeholder engagement, and a commitment to the UN Millennium Development Goals. The Millennium Development Goals, by the way, were altered in the late 1990s. These are internationally set goals. They were altered in the late 1990s to say that by 2015, next year, the number of people without safe access to drinking water and sanitation would be halved. You can see that's actually a watering down, if you'll excuse the pun, of the, uh, uh, of the goal, which originally was that 100% of the population would have that access. Uh, it's not uh, an unreasonable goal in, I think, in a world that has put people on the moon 30 years before we were out there, and it can now produce supercomputers that can do unbelievably complex weather simulations and allow us to play online games with people thousands of miles away, if we wish. Now, in fact, while the number of people living in absolute poverty in Uganda has generally decreased, welcome, that is, since the 1990s, conversely, as a result of population growth and the withdrawal of some centralised provision, the water situation was static or had worsened in many villages between 1972 and the 1990s. <laughs> And you will see here uh, that uh, the left-hand diagram here is water, uh, people with access to decent water supplies in urban and rural areas, urban at the top, rural at the bottom, and the same thing for sanitation on the right. The, the dotted lines are aspirational. So this is, uh, this is the situation, a basically static position. So a lot of investment, goals set, very little progress. It's little better today. Women and children, then when we looked, were walking away from traditional sources and water was costing them a greater proportion of their income. Some sources had effectively been privatised. That's a pretty, pretty sobering sight. I think if you look there, you can see the, uh, the padlock on the, on the borehole. Moreover, when we analysed the groundwater, in a range of villages, we discovered some serious water quality problems illustrated on the slides. This is the environmental science part of what I do. Each village had a zone of shallow contaminated water, you see here, uh, or underneath it, um, and it's represented in this diagram by a very simple parameter, which is electrical conductivity. Okay, it's a, a proxy for measuring how much is dissolved in the water. Uh, it works very well as a, as a proxy and is very simple to measure. But it reflects the fact that the provision of new boreholes in accessible locations in villages hasn't been matched by the provision of sanitation, as we saw in the previous slides. <coughs> Seepage of sewage from pit latrines, laundry water, industrial effluent and other waste materials into and through the ground was contaminating the soil and it was spreading. That's a small village, you can see the contamination zones there, and uh, here's a slightly larger settlement, you can see the contamination seeping away from the centre of the village towards the watercourses. The, uh, the contamination includes inorganic chemical parameters such as nitrate and nitrite and ammonia and phosphates and metallic ions, and also bacteria including es Escherichia coli from human and animal wastes. And this situation is known to the central government, who dispatch monitoring teams out from Kampala to collect and take reference samples back to the capital for analysis, but it's not generally known to the local people, most of whom are illiterate. Now, here we have an example of what I would call uh, a wicked problem. There's a, uh, a child there, and this is a typical seen at a borehole of people queuing with their jerry cans waiting for their water. Wicked problem, there they are again, wicked problem that is very difficult to address and where solutions 
In this case, the provision of boreholes, new boreholes, by aid agencies trying to hit the Millennium Development Goals has had unanticipated consequences. And the story goes something like this. So firstly, rapid population growth necessitates new sources of water, most of which, in the interests of cost, are boreholes or protected springs. And perhaps that's better than nothing. Ugandan national policy, in line with the De Millennium Development Goals, provides a basis for boreholes to be installed such that the population living uh, within one and a half kilometres of a source is maximised. We want the most people closest to the source. Remember, a three kilometre walk with a jerry can for each person in the household and a baby. That's pretty tough. Boreholes are hence installed by all sorts of agencies and indeed some of us in this room have probably supported those initiatives ourselves, predominantly in populated areas where access is maximised but the local groundwater is contaminated from pit latrines and other waste water. Despite that, there is a perception that the water quality is good and there's no perceived need to treat it. People hence abandon their traditional sources and they walk towards the nearest sub substantial settlement to collect the water and it becomes increasingly contaminated over time as our repeat sampling identified. Now this is just one example of an insidious and wicked problem. Wicked problems have particular characteristics as defined in 1973, a long time ago now, by the American researchers Horst Rittle and Melvin Weber. And I'm paraphrasing their work. So they actually had a, a whole string of characters, uh, characterizations of wicked problems, which I've summarized on the slide here. They are problems that are very poor poorly formulated and complex, with interconnected physical, scientific, and human or sociological dimensions, where what happens in one place and one time affects what happens somewhere else at a different time. Many different stakeholders, who don't agree about what's important, who use the terminology, the language in different ways, and who cannot or could not agree if the problem has been solved. Now, environmental problems often have all the characteristics of wicked problems. The point is that wicked problems defy traditional linear solutions, and they require much more innovative ways of thinking and partnerships in order to solve them. Rittle and Weber noticed that, noted that solutions were usually better or worse rather than absolute. You don't solve the problem, you just move a little further towards some sort of solution. And you're also almost inevitably dealing with scientific uncertainty. Now, I want you to ask you to hold in your mind uh, exactly what the problem is here in this example, because that may underpin our approach to a solution. Is it that there is insufficient water, or that someone is polluting the water, or that the contamination is only perhaps in my mind or my student's mind, it doesn't really exist, or it's not known to the local people or the national government? Or is it that appropriate technologies, including communication systems, don't exist? Or is it that the local people are poor and they can't afford to construct effective infrastructure? And what about the appropriate solution? Is it a clean borehole that should be the solution or a piped water supply in the house? Why should rural Ugandans' expectations be less than ours? Now, of late, there's been a, uh, in 2012 actually, a new paper describing something called super wicked problems uh, a paper by, again, another American group uh, headed by Levin. These have additional intractable characteristics, such as the fact that they are urgent. Those who cause the problem also try and find a solution. The, any central authorities, any government is weak or non-existent, and that the policy responses reflect short-term time horizons. Okay. Now, perhaps enough is enough. We don't need super wicked problems. We just need to reflect the fact that these are very complex uh, issues. At the risk of perpetuating the, the misery here, I nevertheless want to add to the story of Uganda's villages. In many cases, 
water yields at these boreholes are quite low. And although typical water demand is modest at about 20 litres per head per day, there is queuing, as we saw, especially in the evening. Incidentally, that 20 litres per head per day is very interesting. Uh, later on this evening, I shall talk about the flooding in Gloucestershire in 2007. 20 litres per head per day is, was then deemed by the emergency services as being the appropriate amount for to maintain minimum standards of civilisation in, in a county like Gloucestershire. I can assure you that it is not enough to do that. So here's the queuing. Now, what happens in the queuing? Well, there's trampling around the installation. You get stagnant pools of water, which attracts mosquitoes. And before we know what's happening, malaria rates rise. Uh, Privatised healthcare flourishes. And because the local inhabitants see this as an indication of progress, they increasingly migrate towards the population centres. So what we're seeing here is a double sort of contingent cycle of wickedness, of course. Now, the, there may be some solutions here, and I put very quickly three technological solutions. Uh, before we do that, we might say, as we often do in this country, well, education for public participation is always a likely contender, and something to which we'll return later on, in fact. Technology and science also play a role. There are new types of portable equipment, allowing very rapid characterization of water quality in areas that may even lack mains electricity. And there we see some, and I think one of my students' hands and part of a foot as well. Um, there are new kinds of toilets being developed. Uh, I'm not sure whether anybody here was at uh, Glastonbury, but some of these were... Actually, I'm looking around to see if anybody was likely to have been at Glastonbury. It's an interesting speculation. Um, there were new types of, of, of toilets where the waste is captured rather than released, and it's treated anaerobically to generate energy and fertiliser. Uh, there's one here called Luwot. Watch out for it. It's, uh, it, it, it's, uh, it, it, it's on the market already. Um, there are rapidly emerging communication technologies uh, invented, in this case, by a UK team based at Oxford University that are starting to address the issues around borehole maintenance using the massively expanding mobile phone network. Uh, more than half the Ugandan population now has a mobile phone it's an astonishing figure, up from 4% in 2004. These technological solutions would give cause for optimism if they are appropriate and addressing the right problems. But that agreement on what the problem is, as I raised earlier, is a very key issue. I'll say more about this African example of an environmental challenge later in my lecture series. Now... How does this concept of wicked problems, which this one is, assist us in addressing environmental challenges? And indeed, can we agree at least what the key environmental challenges that we, the UK, and globally, actually face? Over the course of my lectures, I want to share with you the views of about 80 or so people professionally involved in environmental domains. Many are business people, perhaps not what you may have expected, but all are interested in innovation. And you'll see their views on what matters and how to address the issues differ hugely. Today I've just selected a few examples of some of them reflected on environmental challenges that they think are most important. And I'd like us, I'd like you I to I think there are going listen. to be two uh, main environmental challenges, certainly for the UK. One is going to be climate change and the impact of climate change on the, on the natural environment, for example, on biodiversity. And the, the second uh, impact is going to be population growth and the move, general move of population towards urban areas, which of course is a, a global uh, phenomenon as well. I think the biggest environmental challenges the UK faces going forward are population density and population scale. And that flows into water, it flows into waste, it flows into energy, uh, it flows into resource scarcity. I would say our major challenges are uh, the issues of climate change, uh, resilience and affordability, particularly here in the South West. The, the UK and the world are facing some serious environmental challenges. I think probably some of the biggest relate to um, water. Uh, we have plenty of water on the planet, but it's not in the right place, it's not in the right condition. Um, we're running out of fresh water, 
And unless we do something serious about protecting those resources and recycling those resources, um, some parts of the world, including parts of the UK, will find themselves running out of water. Yeah, although we've made significant improvements in um, curbing pollution from industry and uh, regulated businesses and also to water, we still have some way to go. So I think uh, the major challenges for us would be the environmental performance of regulated business, the quality of water, um, invasive non-native species, um, the management of catchments in such a way that um, we know how to deal with uh, both excess water and too little water. The main environmental challenges which I foresee for the UK as well as for Wales are of course those which are known to us already. For example, the management of carbon emissions and climate change and the consequences of climate change. That is to say, we need to understand how we're going to adapt to a climate that is going to change and how we can mitigate in order to prevent further climate change by managing uh, the greenhouse gases in the environment. The major environmental challenges facing the UK in terms of energy include where to get our future energy supplies from. That will mean having a balance between fossil fuels and existing fuel supplies uh, and new and renewable um, e energy forms in the future. I think when I look at the major environmental challenges facing the world and the UK, they come from population growth and either global population to 2050 with an extra 2 billion people on the planet or um, a 10 million people extra in the UK for the next 25 years, a 17% increase. That's a huge demand for water, for energy, um, we will have a big bang on infrastructure and all of this bears down on the ability of the natural environment to sustain us. It's hard to know where to start with the major environmental challenges of the UK. And also I would say we don't see the environmental challenges in isolation. We see them as connected very much to our economic uh, machinery and our social infrastructure. Uh, but, but, but clearly, as in most parts of the world, we have a changing climate, we have uh, a rising population, we have water scarcity, we have uh, uh, utility or, or power uh, infrastructure challenges ahead of us. Uh, the major environmental challenges facing the UK uh, have to be, uh, for me, relating to global warming uh, and to sea level rise and climate change. Um, it's kind of the elephant in the room with a lot of the discussions uh, you're just thinking back to the environmental movement, just 30 years ago it was all about recycling, um, and direct activism against roads and things, and we've come on such a long way, um, everything really contributes to global warming and climate change. The major environmental challenges across the UK are, for our sector, building new communities, um, housing and everything associated with new communities, hospitals, schools, the infrastructure behind that and the clash with um, the issues affecting climate change within the UK, the location of the communities um, and how we can feed you know, the energy, the water um, and, and all of the infrastructure needed for that. With climate change, flood risk is becoming more and more of an issue. It's always been an issue within the UK. If you think back to 1953 and the tidal surge that we experienced then when uh, over 300 people lost their lives. Flood risk is second only to pandemic flu in terms of national risk to the UK. I think the major environmental challenges facing the UK, uh, well, uh, climate change is uh, obviously one of them. Uh, I'm not one of these people necessarily who puts all of climate change down to man-made inputs. Uh, I think the climate is definitely changing and it's clear that we need to do something about that change uh, and probably more in the way of adaption to climate change than, than, than uh, or mit and mitigation, mitigating the effects of climate change rather than uh, trying to reduce the amount of CO2 we, we're putting out. Like many urban centres around the world, London is growing very, very fast. So in London it's around 100,000 people a year or so. And that is actually the fastest in numbers term that London has ever seen. And that clearly, within our current boundaries and 
mindful of the protection of the green belt, uh, does put a lot of pressure on our current infrastructure and the need to build new infrastructure. So we have two huge challenges to meet that population increase. Uh, one is to ensure that the new infrastructure that we put in, the new developments, are as sustainable as they can reasonably be. And there's also the retrofitting of our older buildings and infrastructure. I think that the environmental challenges facing the UK at the moment are really just the beginning of where we're going to see this country and indeed the world going over the next 30, 40, 50 years. And so those have to be all of the problems associated with climate change and increasing population growth and the, the pressures that that will put on us as a country to actually deliver to meet their needs. So that's going to affect everything from, um, well clearly I'm interested in water in particular, but um, adequate and clean water supply, dealing with water in terms of flooding through climate change, dealing with issues of rising sea level and coastal erosion. But on a more day-to-day -day basis, we've got to deal with building houses for people, how we do that, how we address food, how we address air pollution, water pollution, and really all the consequential problems that come together. There are a number of environmental challenges, but actually I'm going to approach this in a slightly different way. Rather than giving you a list of things like climate change and so on, which I'm sure everybody will say to you, I would say for the UK, our biggest challenge is political and is about political certainty and continuity over policies. In other words, we chop and change every five minutes at the moment. Nobody knows where they stand. We need certainty and political conviction. The major environmental challenge is to enable every citizen to feel that they are part of the solution environmentally and that they can think about how to act effectively and collaborate as a whole to address the solution. Okay, now the key things coming out of that uh, cacophony, if you like, of voices, firstly and self-evidently, people don't share a common view on what's important. Sorry, I should just acknowledge the name, some of the names there. People don't share a common view on what's important. Many relate importance to their own spheres of activity, of course, but they, they cite biodiversity, population pressure, water, energy, and so on. The slide that we saw previously uh, summarises their emphasis. And we heard from a majority for whom clim climate change is a given, and those who remain somewhat sceptical, but not many of those, I hasten to add. For some, these are essentially scientific or technical matters, but for some there's a focus on attitudes or communication, and for others it's politics. Now, politics is a harsh business, and I also want to share with you, for those who are not uh, Daily Telegraph readers, uh, a quote from Owen Paterson. And I'm afraid, uh, prescience, uh, I knew he was going to be speaking today, this is not today's speech. This is one from back in July, as he was stepping down from his role as Environment Secretary. And he does not share the opinions of most of those who I've recorded. And I will just read this out to you. He says, I leave the post with great misgivings about the power and irresponsibly, uh, irresponsibility of, to coin a phrase, the green blob. By this I mean the mutually supportive network of environmental pressure groups, renewable energy companies and some public officials who keep each other well supplied with lavish funds, scare stories and green tape. This tangled triangle of unelected busybodies claims to have the interests of the planet and the countryside at heart, but it is increasingly clear that it is focusing on the wrong issues and doing real harm while profiting handsomely. Local conservationists on the ground do wonderful work to protect and improve wild landscapes, as do farmers, rural businesses and ordinary people. They are a world away from the highly paid globetrotters of the green blob who besieged me with their self-serving demands, many of which would have harmed the natural environment. Now, uh, his view is presumably also shared by 1.8 million people who appear to have liked it on Facebook. I have a suspicion that somebody there has been doing a lot of tapping on a, on a button somewhere. Um, but he evidently is not alone in that view. Now, conflict, resolution, uh, reconciliation, moral hazard and reward 
uh, Mr. Patterson asserting that rewards are seized by the environmental blob, takes us back to G.S. Gilbert, of course, and his wicked world. The wickedness of the problems is essentially what stops us from solving them, even when new technologies might exist that provide some hope. Now, I want to take uh, two examples, much more briefly, of uh, challenges from different domains that illustrate this further. The first one is geoengineering, and I'm not sure whether everybody is familiar with the term. It's the embryonic science of manipulating the world's climate. Deliberate large-scale intervention in the Earth's natural systems intended to counteract climate change, whether human-induced or not. Uh, it does presume that climate change is happening, of course, but we'll, we can set that aside for now. So what we might do is re, uh, altering the re-reflection of the Earth's uh, sun's energy by modifying the reflectance, the albedo of the Earth's surface through painting roofs white, or we could float reflective umbrellas in the upper atmosphere. We could increase the ability of the oceans to absorb carbon dioxide, or we could tinker with the rates of weathering of certain minerals so that they reabsorb carbon dioxide that's been released from buried or vegetative sources and burnt as fossil fuels. We might be able to affect the climate. And some of those technology-rich solutions, you can see a picture here taken from a new scientist in 2009, um, some of these technology-rich solutions do seem to offer genuine possibilities, and a few have actually started to be explored beyond modelling at desk level. There have been limited experiments in ocean seeding, for example, probably. Now, I say probably because that's uncertain. The problem is uh, that almost all the adjustments that are likely to be effective raise major ethical issues for multiple stakeholders. There's an excellent analysis of the likely effectiveness of some of these techniques done by the Royal Society in 2009. And you see on the diagram here, uh, the left-hand side of the diagram is things that are uh, low, if low effectiveness, uh, uh, sorry, low affordability, i.e. they're affordable. These ones are less affordable. And up the side here, uh, things that might be effective and things that probably won't be. Uh, and, of course, uh, the things that we might like to do most in terms of affecting the climate or having most impact are also the most dangerous in terms of uh, international negotiations. So ocean seeding, for example, uh, is probably contrary to the international legislation on pollution. Global scale of forestation might not be as attractive as it sounds. Perhaps, if it is, we might start by thinking about the whole of Surrey or Essex, as an example, before we start telling other people uh, to do it. Altering the upper, the albedo, the reflectance of the upper atmosphere by floating things in it would raise the same challenges as were raised by the US drought-busting cloud seeding experiments of the 1950s and 60s, or incidentally, the alleged uh, USSR experiments on cloud seeding being used as a weapon. These include, uh, these used silver iodide powder, which was shot from the ground in rockets or spread from planes. Now, the failure to achieve liftoff for that kind of technology was not principally a matter of technical capability, it worked. But legal challenges from those downwind who alleged that their rainfall was being stolen. Uh, so, the disagreements there about the problem and the solution, and indeed the fact that intervention in one place would have uh, impacts, adverse impacts, in another place at another time. You can imagine, of course, the international repercussions if the reflectance experiments were overly successful and parts of the world were plunged into a Stygian gloom or even suffered poor summers. Uh, and then there is the whole business of moral hazard. If we rely on geoengineering, will that take us away from what most of our commentators in the recordings say is the need to reduce carbon emissions, rather than on recovering and sequestering fossil fuel-derived carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere. So, again, the wickedness of the problem, the multiplicity of the stakeholders, all of us, in this case, produces a challenge in agreeing what the solution might be. Now, I want to conclude my talk tonight with a final example drawn from my own research. This is research into a notably wicked event in the traditional sense of evil and a generally wicked problem. 
uh, a research project funded by the Natural Environment Research Council concerned the dialogue between scientists and local authorities, both the officers in local government and the elected members, your council members, on the subject of flood management. This is clearly relevant today, uh, following the events of January this year in Somerset and the Thames Valley, and as the newspaper report demonstrated at the time, communication is a barrier. A recent independent headline was uh, said, how weirdo words undermine the war on global warming. It was actually weirdo words from scientists they were commenting on. More familiar, perhaps, will be Eric Pickles, MP, commentary on flooding in the spring this year, when he accused fellow parliamentarians and the Environment Agency of disregarding the facts and failing to dredge rivers, whereas 20 or more professional bodies, although interestingly not the institution of civil engineers, suggested in print that dredging was not the only, or indeed part of, the appropriate solution. My own experience was as technical advisor to Gloucestershire County Council following the serious flooding events of summer 2007. And it demonstrated to me in no uncertain terms that even highly educated people can find it very difficult to communicate with different and multiple stakeholder groups, and hence find it impossible to have a proper dialogue about solutions. This flood event was extremely severe in terms of the damage it caused. Pictures here will be, I'm sure, familiar to you. This is, uh, this is Tewkesbury, often uh, an image that often appears in newspapers. But this is the sort of thing that was involved. And uh, the chief constable at the time, Tim, Tim Brain, noted that in terms of scale, complexity and duration, this is simply the largest peacetime emergency we've seen. Uh, infrastructure, businesses and people's mental health failed or were damaged. But the rainfall event and the river flows were unusual. Just point you out the, the, the damage estimated at three billion. It's almost certainly an underestimate, actually. And one interesting thing here, incipient civil disorder. And I can assure you that the people of Gloucestershire are not prone to civil disorder. Um, but it came close. Um, and there's lots of interesting images, aren't there, of people coping, actually, indeed, in difficult circumstances. Uh, we also lost some of the major infrastructure, and one of the most serious implications was about 350,000 people lacked piped water supply for up to 21 days. That is nearly the breakdown of, uh, 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 of civilization. I can assure you. If you don't have a lavatory, you can't operate anything, actually. So, an unusual event, uh, the diagram there, basically the blue is the more intense rainfall and you can see that band of rainfall there in, in the summer, uh, a few days in the summer in July, sitting across the, the Severn Valley in the west of England. And if you see the crosses here, going from left to right in terms of water years, you can see the, uh, the event of uh, 2007 up there uh, in this one area where typical, the biggest annual flood will be somewhere down here. Uh, calculations somewhere around, in that particular instance, in excess of a one in 1,000 year event, which does, of course, raise issues of how you calculate that kind of uh, frequency. So what happened was a something called a scrutiny inquiry was set up by the County Council, and uh, indeed new legislation intended to manage the situation better followed the Gloucestershire inquiry generated facts which went to review undertaken by Sir Michael Pitt and subsequently was reflected in the 2010 Flood and Water Management Act. Now, I'm going to generalise, horrible generalisation, um, but um, uh, in the case of local authorities who, under this new legislation, have lead authority status in many areas, I would say that neither their elected members nor their staff had the appropriate understandings of the science of the event at the time or the appropriate language to discuss it. The scientists who were attempting to address the problems in their research provided what I would euphemistically perhaps describe as suboptimal a service in explaining what they were doing and why. And they were particularly challenged, councillors that is, uh, sorry, scientists, by explaining concepts such as the uncertainty in the modelling 
where the audience was non-technical. Now, that's not to disregard the sterling and indeed heroic attempts to deal with the event as it unfolded, nor the attempts to remedy some of the issues over the last few years. Progress has been made, particularly in the development of something called sustainable drainage systems. Uh, and I'll just illustrate this with this example. The pictures here are uh, of a small housing area uh, here on this map. This is in Gloucester. Uh, this new housing built at the bottom of a catchment which was already intensively urbanised. Uh, and one might speculate as to why that was ever thought to be uh, an appropriate place for development. That's the housing area that was... Uh, under several feet of water. Some of the houses were designed for disabled people, uh, wheelchair users. The water was four feet deep. That's a difficult situation. Um, so there are attempts now to look at sustainable drainage systems holding the water back in the catchment. But that's, again, something for another talk. Now, in terms of what followed, the scrutiny inquiry re it revealed that some elected members previously involved in planning decisions for land around Tewkesbury were uncertain about the concept, for example, of a floodplain. Despite their many other abilities and qualities, they found engagement with scientific information very problematic. We took, undertook research on this, looking at their sources of information, their learning, the impact of the inquiry process itself on people's ability to engage. Uh, and we identified, again, that the wicked nature of some of these problems was the cause of the challenges. We went on to do another project called Project Foster. If you put your mind around Dr. Foster, uh, there is an acronym in there, something around flood organisation, science and technology and so on. Um, we evaluated ways of sharing ideas between different stakeholder groups using different engagement styles and modes of communication. And um, I'm afraid I have to skip over this in the interest of time, some of it, but uh, it, was, it was an educational research, as it were, f done and evaluated formally. And I will just pause on this one because one of the things we did um, uh, in terms of engagement was to use some different means of communication. And uh, many of the participants in local authorities were very, in I found very interesting that some often somewhat elderly and without much computing experience, or indeed any in some cases, found themselves enjoying learning about flood science in the very strange online world of second life, uh, courtesy of the Open University's virtual seminar rooms. And uh, that's my avatar up there, uh, much slimmer than the, the real thing, of course. Now, um, the point about this is, is we were trying to look at ways of brokering the communications between these different stakeholders, uh, trying to get them to agree on solutions uh, what the solution might be. Is it the cessation of flooding or the increase of resilience? Those are very different things, of course, in the flooding concept. We also looked at things like, why are sustainable drainage systems proving so difficult to deploy? And the issue is that the wickedness of the problem is, again, a key challenge. We'll have to, again, pick up that uh, in subsequent talks. I want to conclude by saying that part of the key to addressing environmental challenges, oh yes, agreeing whether what the problem is, this, this is Stratford-upon-Avon actually, and the, the, the child here thinks flooding is great. Uh, she doesn't see a problem at all. Um, if her parents had known what was probably in the water, there might have been more of an issue, I suspect. She has bare feet, as you see. Um, so, um, right, let's just leave that a minute. The science and technology, uh, in a trying to identify the, uh, the wickedness uh, and using that as a basis for exploration, the science and technology has to be clear and appropriate, and it has to avoid solutions that simply push the problems into new domains or new geographical areas, further down the catchment, for example, or into, onto a different set of people. Sometimes the se suggested technology today is neither clear nor appropriate. The emerging innovative technology around toilets in the developing world, for example, produces a lot of hot air metaphorically as well as literally, but it might not be a real solution to the actual problem as people experience it. Who will service the highly technical kit required uh, to manage those uh, facilities, for instance? 
In my view, too, the geoengineers do need to be free to research further into science of some solutions, even if it's potentially challenging to establish its validity and appropriateness, and that there may be a moral hazard in doing so. So, the technology has to be uh, appropriate and clear. Secondly, approaches to innovation have to be open, as writers such as Henry Chesborough have demonstrated for successful businesses. The framing of research into technologies and solutions must, may best be shared at an early stage, requiring partnerships rather than isolation to achieve success. That's something, again, to which I'll return later in my talks. And thirdly, the involvement of the different stakeholders in genuine partnerships is required, as Sherry Arnstein pointed out many years ago in a key paper. Communication to solve wicked problems cannot just be telling people what is going to happen for manipulative or therapeutic reasons, because wicked problems are not soluble in that way. Communications has to move, oops, communication must generally move higher up the ladder of participation, thank you very much, into, into more genuine two-way traffic. <coughs> Not knowledge transfer, but engagement. From a situation where people are merely informed through collaboration and partnership into what's here identified as citizen control. Uh, wicked problems, that's a requirement. Uh, in Africa, for example, some of the means of doing that do now exist, having those communications. And the mobile phone is indeed transforming what is taking place and the ability of people to learn and to contribute to environmental solutions. Texting, if not blogging and tweeting, have some transformative power in this arena, where formerly the reliance on an unreliable postal service was the norm. In the UK, citizen recording of flooding events is having radical effects on our ability to model flows in real time and hence to understand more about how to manage the situation. So there are genuine uh, uh, areas of progress, uh, which the, the lad, I think, in the, uh, the African lad in the picture on the right there, should be able to benefit from. However, for him and his colleagues to take control, people must be speaking the same language, literally or metaphorically, and at the moment, frequently, they do not and are not. Thank you.